For the person who blindly spurns the love overtures of the double, the rebuffed archetype may take revenge through transformation into this negative. Such could have been the fate of Gilgamesh and Enkidu if at their first meeting they had not recognized the love force between them. Mm. It is, by the way, the theme of the novel of Frankenstein. <clears throat> Conclusions. In conclusion, Awareness of the double expands our understanding of diverse human phenomena such as homosexuality, group bonding, and war. Recognition of the double simultaneously enriches and simplifies our vision of the psyche. We can see the field of anima animus and the double as containing the source of sexual identities, projections, and complexes. It is the center of this field, then, which gives rise to the significant archetype of the androgyne. And it is this androgyne which in turn may lead us to a more differentiated vision of the entire psyche. Just as the anima and animus appear to us as mysterious sources, so too does the double. Yet it is this double which has been and continues to be a significant factor in social and cultural phenomena. If we are to continue elaborating consciousness into more subtle awareness, we must give this archetype its rightful due and learn to see its potentials for individual and society. Mm. Not bad. Mm. There you have it. They bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and for this annual, you know, come out at that time, now it comes out twice a year, at that time it came out only once a year, you know, so it's especially good mm -hmm. to get your paper in there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were very bold, you know. And, they didn't follow it up, of course. It was like a one shot. You know. I mean, I got I had a paper of mine, a follow up paper published many years later. In 1991, was it? 92? Uh, there was a follow up paper, but not, I don't think it's anything overly homosexual except one thing by Robert Hoppe in between my, that thing I just read to you and uh, my follow up paper, which came out in the early 90s. One, perhaps one over homosexual thing, can you believe it? Mm -hmm. And it's been dreadful since up until recently, where it's only recently, the last two, three years, begun to change more, more interesting, with you know, being like more so we get into how a Jungian thought, officially, and the formal Jungian thought might have changed around these topics. But nonetheless, there you have it. Uh, I hope you might have found it uh, entertaining or interesting and curious, especially in light of how I framed it for you. I, I thought, oh, isn't it would be an interesting way not just to read it, you know, which is easy enough to do. But what would be a way to frame it that you might find an interesting dimension in, in hearing it as I read it? And I thought that was a pretty interesting one. <laughs> Keep in mind, from my point of view, writing that paper was my uh, greeting card to get me in the door of serious Jungian psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. That's how I entered my own serious therapy by writing that paper, basically, because it got me so inflated, and the whole thesis for which that paper is still got me so inflated uh, that I had a big depressive crash, a very massive one. Uh, and I just intuitively knew I had to follow my paper there and actually enter what the paper was all about, meaning what I've since discovered by then doing what I discovered I had to do, which was Jungian thought is not thought. Jungian ideas are not ideas. And first I only knew them this way, the way I just read to you. Uh, ways to understand things, way, ways to conceive of framing experiences that were helpful and respectful to those experiences. Believe it or not, the paper I just read to you was an attempt to do that vis a vis this kind of visionary, subjective, uh, strange experience, personal experience I've had. Uh, and that was why I wrote the paper in the way, so that I could account for it, understand it, and grasp it in, in some intellectual way or some way my thinking mind could make sense of it and build upon it. Uh, and then I discovered that this was not a mere system of ideas, which is the way I first approached it, or even a way to understand things uh, in the ways I had used it. Now, all of that, I soon enough discovered, was all a preparation for the practice of analysis, and that I was dabbling. I was dab personally dabbling, and I felt after a little while, once I reached my peak and then tumbled, I felt that my dabbling had made me somehow connected because of the way Jungians relate with the psyche. I'd become connected with the psyche, but not with the skills or abilities to handle that greater connection. And that was after me, mortally. That's what I stumbled into or tumbled into at that point. 
And that's when I turned to David Stockford, who at that time, with his partner, was the first out gay man to be in training to become a licensed, you know, a licensed certified young analyst. Uh, and I started working with him. And this is what, this is what drove me to do that. Because I just knew intuitively is what, they're, what Jung is talking about, what they're all talking about, is this is a practice. It's not simply ideas or thoughts or way to do something. And I'm so grateful that I was able to appreciate that and, and take it quite seriously and actually do that and, and go and spend what would have, been, would have been my money, but was not. In my case, was money by the state because it was called Medi-Cal back then. I was anti-establishment. I wouldn't do anything for the establishment, but I would tolerate having Medi-Cal, which is a great hassle for David, who was a psychiatrist. You had to be a licensed professional, you just happened to be a psychiatrist, to even be in the training program. And so he was happy to, even though I was an oddball, he was delighted to take me on. He took me for free. I never paid him a dime for uh, eight and a half years. <laughs> And then I came down here to see Marsha, who was my second analyst, for seven and a half years. So, but anyway, uh, that's how I learned it. With more than 15 and a half years of doing this as a practice. That's how I learned it, in my opinion. That's the way to learn this, in my opinion. Uh, uh, and so I grew, because as you can imagine, I grew from someone who just approached Jung and thought in the ways I just read to you, to then what came of all that. That was how I tried to start with it. Uh, and if you've seen any of my later writings, uh, you might have some sense of where all that then grew and developed over the years. If you've been following uh, that career or our own for any reason, uh, you know the different perhaps stages it has gone through in terms of thinking of these notions of combining uh, gay liberation thought with uh, analytic psychology and um, uh, its associated uh, ways of understanding the psyche, like uh, uh, Freudian based psychoanalysis or other related methodologies. These days, more feeling-based methodologies, for example, uh, but more sensation-based methodologies too, uh, are still all an outgrowth of the idea of psychodynamic subjectivity. So uh, uh, I find this all really, really interesting uh, because, uh, as I had sensed intuitively, not, not just with that paper, but even before that, what would even go in this direction, as I've shared in other meetings, I wanted to become a psychologist when I was 13 years old. Why would that be interesting? Just personally. Why would that be so? As a way to understand, I don't know what to call it. You know, back then it was, why are we all doing what we're doing? Why would I have this people call my family? This person called my mother? This person called my father? This person called me the son? This other person said called my brother? This other person called my sister? I'm dead serious. Like this is the way I was functioning and at 13. To me, it was not a fait accompli. In large part because I was queer, you know. <laughs> and one of those things. I couldn't help it. The boys were encroaching, you know. Like, like, <laughs> Hourly, I'm trying to stay calm, you know, but <laughs> I couldn't help it, you know. It was overwhelming and its significance to me. Not just the thrill of the direct arousal, but I mean the import of the, 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 the charge, that, that spirit, uh, the personality of the spirit that, you see, I found so interesting that Jung, Jungian thought was respecting of that notion, translated that notion, which otherwise is an ancient notion, a tribal notion. Um, a notion which sees uh, other things as animated with projective symbolism or the meaning of subjective projections. Um, <coughs> Jung respected that kind of experience. I couldn't believe that. I didn't see anyone else doing that at that time academically. Now we have different systems that claim to respect that form. Uh, however, in comparison, like various forms of postmodernism, for example, I won't get into the details with you, but in my opinion, they're all inferior to uh, a Jungian approach or, in a broader sense, a psychoanalytic approach. In the deconstruction of reality, I agree that reality is a construction. Absolutely. That's not a notion of postmodernism at all, by any means. That reality has always been considered a construction by any serious spiritual tradition. Going back thousands and thousands of years, it's nothing new. The idea that reality is a construction rather than a given or a fait accompli. It's a human, by like, a human construction, not a divine construction, a human construction. This is one of the essences, in my experience and opinion, of what any serious spiritual tradition teaches. And I don't mean by teaches the exoteric teaching, when you go to church or whatever, I mean the esoteric teaching, the inner, it's the secret, when you become a master, or a, an initiate, an alchemist, or whatever they would call it in their particular system, uh, a Taoist master, or whatever, you know, different kinds of systems. I mean, whatever, all cultures have these things. It's nothing new. What's relatively new is it called psychology, or your psychoanalysis. Now, my opinion, that's true postmodernist thought, not what's called postmodernism. In other words, 
deconstructing one's own construction of the experience of oneself as real in an analytic way is it gets one to one's truth of subjective being, whereas you know, things that mimic that, like um, postmodern analysis, keep one external to one's own felt being. It's always it's always as if there's something outside of subjectivity in the analysis of it, of whatever's being analyzed. This is a lie. It's all a lie. Therefore, in my opinion, all postmodernism is a, is a fake psychoanalysis. It's an attempt to substitute for a psychoanalytic deconstruction of one the writer's own subjective presence and being in the moment. And that is the absolute, there is nothing beyond that. Once it's invented in psychoanalysis, there's only the reiteration of it or opposition to it. That's all there is, intellectually. And intellectually, that's the rise of postmodernism, which is the new form of reaction. I argue the new form of reaction. It's known as the old form of reaction before the invention of psychoanalysis, still here. And the new form of reaction, postmodernism. Most, not all forms. Some, some forms, as you know, postmodernism attempt to integrate some, some kind of psychological ideas, like Lacan and Eric Lacan. He calls himself psychoanalyst, but no, no serious psychoanalyst takes that seriously. It's bullshit. And I consider it bullshit. It's utter bullshit. Again, it's looking from outside subjectivity to understand subjectivity. Impossible. It's impossible to do. But you can say it. We're now sitting on the planet Uranus smoking. <laughs> by water pipes. You see, you can say anything. Is that true? You want to say anything about anything? And do, and does, everyone does. We're doing it constantly. So what? <laughs> so I see we have a little time left. Oh, look, we have a good time left. This is excellent. We don't usually get this indulgence as a short paper, yeah. but really historic. Okay, so you see I'm kind of beginning to set a broader atmosphere. Uh, to stimulate you, if you uh, if having any experiences from what I'm sharing, and we're going to eventually open it up. I'm going to open it up to all of you guys' reactions. We have conversation, I hope. This is one aspect of what I really wanted by this space becoming more of what's called a club, a public club. Make sure that in the future you reiterate this is a public event. Thank okay. you. Uh, versus a closed event or a private event. Thank you. Because uh, I think it's an important feature of what, why it, generates the charge it does. No, sorry, no, air conditioning, isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. It's getting stuffy. I'm wearing this for the air conditioning. It's supposed to be here. Because it's stuffy, right? I'm sorry, I'm just noticing that. Why is not the air conditioning? <laughs> I'm wearing this damn thing, there's no air conditioning. <laughs> it's stuffy, I know, I hope you're not all suffering. But whenever not freezing, on the other hand, it's a drag, right? So you got the coat for the air conditioning. Right? <laughs> 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 I let my hair down a little bit, excuse me because I'm trying to uh, in invite us all to be uh, more embodied here. We're in individual chairs, okay, uh, which is the typical form, which is one, one, one aspect we wanted to have of this general meeting, is less intimidating, to have things be in regular chairs, and everyone's facing the same way, and it's the, it's the non-threatening, usual arrangements of things. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> I invite you all to uh, uh, feel your own bodies and to feel the, uh, uh, whatever experiences have been triggered or thoughts or ideas by uh, what I've uh, shared so far, or will continue to. Uh, perhaps you might have a little interaction for a little while. Uh, uh, it may or may not be interesting to be present here with probably the world's foremost gay union. I know it's a extremely obscure. <laughs> <laughs> And not only is it extremely obscure, uh, it's frowned on in many gay quarters. <laughs> yeah, you may not be aware that all of you are here this evening, but in certain so-called progressive gay spiritual quarters, it is frowned on for anyone to come to this event. And seriously discouraged and has been for many years. Many years. And I'm going to let any of you know who are happen to be here, you have somehow evaded that <laughs> dragnet to be here, one way or another, because everything I am and everything I've done for uh, more than a generation now has been banned by uh, my opponents. To be not spoken of, for example, with Dr. Kel Hefner's more recently in the last decade, uh, uh, retellings of early gay fi fairy history, the founding of the Radical Fairies, as you all know from Doug Satonic's recent article in the Unstarper Gay and Lesbian Review, uh, Harry had reduced me to a tiny footnote. And actually, I'm more important to the formation of the fairies than he is. Than the fairies and he is. Donna reduced you to it. Yeah, Donna reduced me to a footnote.